that hearing, chaired by Congressman Mike Sinar, a Democrat from Oklahoma. Subcommittee will come to order. Today's hearing is a continuation of this subcommittee's review of the status of our nuclear weapons complex. The Department of Energy owns 17 facilities throughout the nation dedicated to the research, development, and testing of our nuclear weapons. The facilities are managed and operated by private firms under contract with the department. Today, that complex is in a state of disrepair. In recent years, critical facilities have been forced to suspend operations due to safety and environmental problems. The startup of essential products uh, pro projects have been delayed or canceled. The taxpayers will be forced to pay $100 billion or more for environmental cleanup at these sites, and the health and safety of citizens living near some of these facilities has been imperiled. Clearly, this is a dismal track record, which raises questions about the management practices and policies at these, sites, at these sites. The department has provided its contractors with broad exemptions for financial and legal liability and paid them hundreds of millions of dollars in awards and bonuses despite serious environmental and safety management problems. The Department of Energy has effectively left itself no way to control the performance of its contractors or to hold them fully accountable for their actions. Recent government studies underscore this problem. A report by the Department of Energy's own Inspector General concluded that the department's contractors face no significant financial risk because the Department of Energy's policy to pay all contractors' costs, including those incurred as a result of mismanagement and even fines. Today, the subcommittee will release a report by the General Accounting Office which details the Department of Energy's payments of millions of dollars in bonuses and awards to Rockwell International at Rocky Flats Weapon Plant, despite the department's own recognition of serious environmental and safety problems at that facility. Additional evidence and information collected by GAO and others indicate that practices at Rocky Flats are consistent throughout the entire weapons complex. Clearly, it is time to fundamentally report a reform the traditional Department of Energy contractor relationship. Even top DOE officials recognize the need to change the culture which exists within the department. I applaud the department's new leadership for its candor and its efforts to instill and enforce a high standard of excellence at the department, and will do all that I can to help them succeed in this effort. But this is only part of the equation. Today, contractors are an integral part of the weapons complex. Unless and until that changes, they, may al they also will be firmly held to a high standard of excellence. It is in this area where the Department of Energy officials are sending mixed signals. On one hand, they are attempting to reform the contractor fee program. We'll be reviewing that today. However, the Department of Energy officials still appear willing to let the taxpayers foot the bill for costs resulting from contractor errors and even fraud. It is unclear to this member why citizens must bear the cost of contractors' failures to perform with expertise and quality that they were hired to do. Even more disturbing is the special treatment afforded contractors who failed to comply with the environmental laws of this nation. The department continues to pay all fines and penalties incurred by contractors, thereby allowing them ex to escape responsibility for their actions. At least one such payment has already been made this year. Moreover, the leadership of the department took the unprecedented step of attempting to secure some degree of immunity for one of its contractors. There's a possibility that the Department of Energy may wish to extend similar protection to the operators of other facilities. This matter is very disturbing to many members of Congress. Our constituents, our industries, and even our state and municipal governments are equally responsible for complying with our environmental laws. It is inappropriate to set a different standard of accountability for the contractors who operate and manage the Department of Energy's nuclear facilities. This is a very important issue. 
If it is not properly resolved, it could undermine the department's efforts to improve the quality of its operations and to establish the credibility it needs with the American public. Mr. Klinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you and the subcommittee staff for your efforts in calling today's hearing, a uh, hearing which I agree with you is a very important and dis discussing a very important issue. I believe and hope that the information gathered here today will be constructive for the Department of Energy as it evaluates how this administration can improve contractor accountability at our nation's nuclear defense facilities. As headline after headline have indicated, our nuclear defense production facilities are in a state of disrepair. Too many of these facilities have been out of compliance with our nation's environmental laws in the past. Appropriately, much of the focus of today's hearing will be on past problems associated with these nuclear facilities. A number of these problems were, quite frankly, the result of poor management on the part of contractors whose expertise we rely upon and poor oversight on the, department, on the part of the Department of Energy and its predecessor agencies charged with ensuring that these facilities are operated in a manner that does not unnecessarily endanger human health or pose an undue threat to the environment. As Energy Secretary Watkins has stated, there is a culture at the Department's nuclear facilities that must be changed. I think anyone familiar with the ongoing problems at these plants would agree that changing that culture is far easier said than done. However, we should applaud uh, Secretary Watkins for his forthright evaluation of the seriousness of the problem and his efforts to address it. I am convinced of his sincerity to dramatically increase the sensitivity of the Department regarding uh, these important environmental issues. We should work with him in a cooperative spirit to accomplish this most difficult management assignment. Today we are going to hear from the Department of Energy's Inspector General, who will outline some of the past practices and current problems with the Department's uh, contractor indemnification uh, policy. It is my understanding that the Secretary has read the Inspector General's report and will shortly be reviewing recommendations for reform suggested to him by the Department's uh, General Counsel and the Assistant Secretary for Management and Administration based on their findings. Like other members of Congress, I am heartened by the steps being initiated by the Department at this time. Award fee reform is one such initiative currently being undertaken by proposing that at least 51 percent of the award fees available to contractors be dedicated to meeting environmental, safety, and health objectives. The Department has taken an appropriate and overdue step, perhaps, toward ensuring that facility employees, local residents, and the environment are indeed protected. The Department has bitten off a lot in its desire to restore credibility to DO Department of Energy operations. As the principal oversight subcommittee for the Department of Energy, uh, we will, I'm sure, be monitoring the Department's follow-through. However, I think I speak for both uh, Chairman Siner and myself when I say that the subcommittee stands ready to be of assistance to the Department in any way we can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Klinger. And let me just say that I want to thank you and Kirk both for the outstanding job you've done in working with us in a, a very bipartisan nature with respect to this hearing. Mr. Douglas. Mr. Chairman, I think today is typical of the great clash we're going to see between the need for nuclear weapons and our national defense and the need for a safe working environment and a safe environment around these plants. So I look forward to the testimony and hopefully as part of our oversight we can make sure that we have our weapons produced but in a safer and more environmentally sound manner. Thank you, Mr. Douglas. Our first witness today uh, will be Mr. John C. Layton, Inspector General of the United States Department of Energy, and he will be accompanied by Mr. Pat Brooks. You two gentlemen would come to the table. As you know, it is the custom of this subcommittee in order not to prejudice past or future witnesses to swear all of our witnesses in. Do either one of you have an objection to being sworn in? If not, if you'd raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Welcome, Mr. Layton, back to our subcommittee. Uh, we look forward to your comments this morning. Your entire testimony will be made part of the record and we look forward to your comments at this point. Mr. Chairman, in your letter of October 13, 1989, you requested that I present testimony and answer questions regarding the Office of Inspector General's recent report on the Department of Energy's... Pull it, pull it towards you just a little bit. <clears throat> there you go. How are you doing? On the Department of Energy's indemnification practices with respect to management and operating contractors. 
The purpose of the indemnification report was to review the Department of Energy's policies and practices regarding both the nuclear and non-nuclear indemnification of its management and operating contractors. We found that the Department's fundamental policy is, with exceptions, to completely indemnify its m and contractors, bear substantially all risks, both nuclear and non-nuclear, and pay all costs associated with running its facilities. These costs include fines, penalties, claims, losses, and damages. In summary, virtually all costs incurred by m and contractors can be expected to be paid under the contracts. There are some major exceptions to total indemnification, including costs that have been specifically identified in the contract as unallowable, losses or expenses that result from willful misconduct or lack of good faith on the part of a few contractor personnel, key personnel, the fines and penalties on activities outside the scope of work or without contracting officer approval, the Department's indemnification of nuclear activities is required by the Price-Anderson Amendments Act of 1988, which also subjects the contractors to both civil and criminal penalties. Non-nuclear indemnification is permitted through general contract authority. As a result of our review, we found that in the face of the Department's indemnification policies, the award fee mechanism constituted a very important financial incentive for contractor performance. The award fee is incorporated in 29 of the Department's 52 active m and contracts. We also found that although the Price-Anderson Amendments Act of 1988 provides for civil penalties against the contractors, existing language in m and contracts would appear to allow indemnification of the contractors from such penalties. We recommended in our report that the contracts be modified to resolve this apparent conflict. Another issue we discussed in the report is that some m and contractors are set up as independent corporations, separate from their parent corporations and without significant assets. We consequently recommended that DOE ascertain whether civil penalties could in fact be collected from such subsidiary corporations. In addition, we noted that the administrative procedures necessary to implement the civil penalties program as authorized by the Price-Anderson Amendments Act of 1988 were not yet in place and we recommended that that be done. Looking at indemnification from a broader perspective, <clears throat> namely relieving corporate personnel from personal responsibility, we noted that one contract, which is no longer active, did provide DOE with the contractual right to, de to demand removal of a contractor employee from DOE work. We also noted that the Department of Energy Acquisition Regulations clause on this subject used in the M&O contracts appeared to have erroneously omitted such a right of removal. We have recommended that such a right of removal be inserted in the M&O contracts. We also found that in five of the Department's M&O contracts, reasonableness was not used as a definitive criterion for determining the allowability of costs. We recommended that the Department reconsider this situation. Finally, we recommended that the Department consider increasing the number of contractor personnel whose actions could result in corporate liability and also consider identifying other circumstances, for example, environmental fines and penalties for which the contractor would be held financially responsible. We have discussed DOE's current indemnification policies and practices with departmental officials. Some DOE officials have expressed the belief that the department's current policy of comprehensive indemnification represents the most practical and least costly alternative available to the department. They believe that if the department did fully indemnify its contractors, the risks to the contractors would be so great that the department would be unable to find qualified contractors to run the department's facilities. In addition, they believe that the fees currently paid to the department's m and contractors are very low and reflect in large measure the absence of substantial financial risk to the contractors. Accordingly, these departmental officials contended that any changes in this current indemnification policy that would increase the risk to the contractors would result in demands for greatly increased fees. In addition, they believed that the extent to which the contractors were not indemnified from loss by the department would necessitate the contractors acquiring insurance coverage. Such insurance, even if available, 
would be, in their opinion, tremendously costly and would have to be borne by the Department as a cost of the contract. As a result of our report, the Secretary stated in a memorandum to me on September 22nd that he had directed that the recommendations we made be reviewed for appropriate corrective action. Further, he has directed that this re review be completed in 60 days. This concludes my opening remarks, and I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. Layton, and also to you, Mr. Brooks, for the outstanding effort in this respect. I'll proceed under the five-minute rule. Mr. Layton, what are the major exceptions uh, to the total indemnification? The exceptions include on reasonable, on reasonable costs, costs that are unallowable by the terms of the contract, costs that are incurred by the willful misconduct of a key few corporate uh, executives, contractor officials, and activities that are performed outside of the scope of work, which would include fines and penalties for such activities. All right, let's, let's look at these exceptions in more depth. Now, for costs to be allowable, they have to be based upon reasonable, reasonableness, including prudent business judgment. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Now, did you find any examples of cost being disallowed due to unreasonableness? I'm not aware of a case where costs have been allowed uh, disallowed after the fact due to unreasonableness. Uh, the present system provides that uh, some determination of reasonableness will be made uh, before the fact. For example, subcontracts of these prime M&O contractors are reviewed uh, if they approach a certain threshold by DOE management officials prior to the entering into those contracts. So before the fact, there is some review for reasonableness. But after the fact, we didn't find any disallowed costs. So here's the situation. The Department of Energy has spent billions of dollars uh, on management and operating contractor activities over the last uh, couple of years, yet no contractor uh, expenditures over the last three fiscal years have been judged to be unreasonable. Doesn't that seem to be a little bit low? Yes, it does. Well, let me put it another way. Is there room for the contract offices to more aggressively apply that reasonableness standard? Yes, I think so. And I think when Admiral Watkins talks about changing cultures, that's one of the things that's a culture that needs to be changed, that we have to spend more time, the Department of Energy has to spend more time thinking about reasonableness of costs. Well, let me explore that a little bit more. Isn't it true that even some of the DOE contracts do not even contain a reasonableness standard for determining the cost, and therefore um, meaning that the Department of Energy pays everything? Yes, that's true in the case of um, the AT&T contract at Sandia. There, I don't believe that reasonableness is mentioned in that contract. And the uh, contracts with the University of California have um, a statement that cost must be reasonable to be, uh, to be allowable. But then it goes on to say that um, they, will, they will be considered reasonable um, unless they were um, incurred by the willful misconduct of a few key executives. They're allowable unless the, and if that criteria is uh, not So made. under those contracts where that clause does not exist, the Department of Energy pays even if they're unreasonable costs, don't they? Yes, and I, I think the Department needs to consider, reconsider the reasonableness tests. You'd consider that pretty extreme, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. All right. Now, another reason for disallowing costs is, quote, mis a willful misconduct or bad faith, unquote. As a part of the, uh, as a part of a few key personnel. Now, generally, how many individuals on site qualify as key personnel? Well, it can be as few as one person, and I don't know what the maximum number is. So, unless the contractor's employee is quote the key employee, the cost resulting from fraud or even theft would be reimbursed by the government, wouldn't they? Yes, that's correct. Well, doesn't that create a situation, Mr. Layton, where the top officials on site have absolutely no incentive to know what's going on? That may be the case. The, um, and as you know, in our report, we recommended that the number of key uh, officials be expanded or consideration be given to expanding the number of key officials so that there w would be more people who had this incentive. I think that there are other incentives that exist, but 
to answer your question, I think there needs to be... Uh, well, that goes across the grain of what the Department of Energy is trying to do, which is to get management involvement out of its contractors, doesn't it? It may. Now, what kind of incentive uh, does this provide for non-key personnel, Mr. Layton? Well, I think the first thing is we recommended expanding the number of key personnel to, uh, to give more incentive. And the uh, second point uh, along that lines is that those key personnel are responsible for incentivizing the people below them, making it a, a requirement of the subordinate personnel to report aberrant behavior or, or uh, unauthorized acts. Okay. Let's look at the three exceptions on indemnification which you cited in your report. Now, in the course of your inspection, your office contacted all eight Department of Energy operation offices and asked whether during the last three years they had disallowed any cost incurred under their management and operating contract they administered. What did you find? One operations office, to the best of my recollection, reported that they had disallowed costs, and that was the Savannah River Operations Office. And an example that they cited was the $64.5 million in severance pay. The, uh, upon termination of the contract, there was a, an issue of whether or not the DuPont was going to be reimbursed for paying severance pay to its employees, and, and the uh, department told uh, DuPont that they would not make that reimbursement. And that case is now, that situation is now in, in court. I'm going to invest, I'm going to come into that in a second. Now, in your testimony, you cite two recent cases in which the department acted to recover funds. You cite the recovery of $150,000 from Rockwell and $595,000 from the University of California for their actions connected with the ordering and production of mementos and trinkets and personnel items at government expense. Now, Mr. Layton, as you know, this subcommittee has had a long-standing interest in that matter. Now, let, to, to go over the record, the incident uh, occurred back in June 1985, and the FBI in our first investigation uh, was completed in mid-1987, and our subcommittee held a hearing in December of 1987. Yet the first recovery action by the department didn't take place until December of 1988. Now, isn't it the fact, Mr. Uh, Layton, that the recovery actions by the department only took place after several investigations and reviews and recommendations by your office and, and also a hearing by this subcommittee? That's a fact, but I might add that I don't know that the department knew the extent of the loss prior to those audits or investigations. I think we provided them with the information that made that uh, made it possible for them to take these collect, correct, collective collection actions. But it was, the point was is that it was due to your investigation and our review through hearing that really caused them to go back and try to get this reimbursed. Isn't that correct? Oh, I'd like to take credit for it, yes. Okay. Isn't it also true that in the case of the department's decision not to reimburse DuPont when it uh, gave nearly $70 million in severance pay to Savannah River employees who were not going to lose their jobs, uh, came after a flash report by your organization and also an inquiry by this subcommittee? That's correct. But once, once again, I don't know that the department knew that was an issue until we raised it. Okay. The point is, is that these management and operating contracts only contain very narrow exclusions for total indemnification. And, but the fact that we have billions of dollars uh, in contracts and virtually no disallowed cost leaves one big question. And that question is, are the DOE contracting officers even trying to be aggressive in these narrow areas that are available to them? Would you agree uh, that the Department of Energy must be uh, more intensive in its oversight of these uh, DOE costs? I believe that there's room for contracting officers to be more aggressive in the determination of reasonableness. And I also think, and, I, and I've testified to this before, the contract administration is key to making these m and contracts work. It's key to making any contract work, but particularly, in my opinion, critical in these contracts. And I think that's what the Admiral also is talking about when he talks about culture, putting more people at sites, that he recognizes that need and is attempting to correct that situation. Well, let me ask this, if I could. Even if the contracting officer disallowed the cost, which is what we're trying to accomplish here, how does the Department of Energy ensure the contractor does not get paid? 
think it's important to understand how an M&O contract works. And it's a complicated process, but I will try to make it as simple as possible. And I realize I'm under oath, so there may be a, may be a little bit of a need to correct this. But Pat, if you can jump in here. With an M&O contractor, the contractor is essentially spending the government's funds when they write the checks. Therefore, there is not a voucher received like there is with a traditional contractor, which people can then review and say, we sign off on these costs or they were appropriate. When the costs are incurred, they are expended and are drawn down on a letter of credit from the government funds. Therefore, in my opinion, contract administration, these acts of the predetermining <coughs> excuse me, predetermining whether a cost is appropriate or not, for example, the review of subcontracts is critical to the success of an M&O contract. And it, it's in that area where you have the ability to, to avoid costs rather than, than collect them back after they have been incurred. And as you're aware, as I've testified, they don't have assets of any appreciable amount in these uh, companies that are running our facilities. Well, the answer really is they can't ensure that they're not paid because they draw down on that letter of credit. They're, this is after the money is spent, so the Department of Energy is in, a, in, in the posture of recovering. Is that correct? That's correct. All right. So they can't stop it, all right? Now let's look at the policy implications for all of this for just a moment. I think that there are opportunities to stop it. For example, the 64.5. If you know in advance that an expenditure is to be incurred, and you say no, there is an opportunity to stop it in advance. But the point is, is that once the once payment's it's out of, been made, once it's... Once the horse is out of the barn, you can't get it back. Exactly. Easily. Now, contractors are totally, effectively, what we've learned here in just the last couple of minutes, and I apologize to my colleagues, and I'll give them extra time. The contractors are totally indemnified for all practical purposes. Even in the cases of outright fraud, the costs are likely to be paid for by the government. And as we have seen from your reports, uh, that's exactly what has happened. The Department of Energy, if I could review this, has not even made much to the narrow avenues which they have available to them. What it appears to this member is, is that the Department of Energy has effectively eliminated all the risk to the contractors. So how does the Department of Energy penalize these contractors if nothing's at stake? The Penalties as I see them, and there's probably more, but the ones that come to mind are would be award fees, and that's in 29 of the 52 contracts they have award fees. Contractors, for the most part, are large, well-known public institutions, private institutions in the public eye that have reputations at stake. We have the opportunity to withhold funds from their management allowance, and approximately every five years there's an extend uh, or compete decision made and that at that point it's the de it's determined whether or not we want to keep that contract or compete it and see if uh, somebody else can win win that contract so I think they're not as dramatic maybe a uh, ways of penalizing a contractor but there are some ways to penalize a contractor well, let me let me uh, summarize here in just two brief comments to make the record clear, what you're saying here is, is that award fees, are, award fees are very important incentives, but what you're not saying is that they have been effectively used. Is that correct? I haven't done audit work to verify that. Um, they, are, they are a tool that's available. Whether they've been used effectively or not, I think you have witnesses that are going to come on after me that will establish that. Well, let me invite you to stick around to hear GAO who will testify next. Let me, last question. In your report, you note that the department personnel expressed the belief that the Department of Energy did not fully indemnify its contractors and that the risk, uh, uh, if they did not fully indemnify their contractors, that the risk would be so great that no qualified companies would be willing to operate these facilities. I guess the natural question from that uh, position in the report is, is it a good attitude for the Department of Energy to bring to the bargaining table. I mean, how can the Department of Energy really adequately represent the interest of the government and the taxpayer if their only concern is retaining the party who's they're trying to bargain with? Well, I, I agree that would not be a good attitude to bring to the bargaining table. 
And I think it's been demonstrated that there are companies willing to enter into these contracts. We've seen a turnover in contractors in the last uh, few years. So I think there are contractors, and I believe that there are people who would be willing to run these facilities. Mr. Klinger? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Layton. Um, just following up on the Chairman's line of questioning here, in your testimony you uh, note that uh, Department of Energy officials uh, take some exception to uh, your report on the grounds that uh, that they feel that the present uh, procedures ensure the lowest cost of the government because if uh, if we were to require more we would um, either get involved in having to have the contract get insurance which could be very costly or the contract costs would increase substantially or secondly that we would uh, perhaps run the risk of not having anybody available to do this work. Now you suggested that that would not be the case. Do you think that there are contractors who would be uh, out there who would be interested in doing this work even if there were more stringent uh, controls or uh, uh, monitoring put on them? But there are a finite number of these uh, entities that would be available to do this. How do you balance that? In other words, uh, how do you assess those criticisms that, uh, that we have a very delicate balance here and that uh, it is a somewhat unique situation from other types of uh, federal contracts where we, uh, we really have a, an imperative need to have this work done and uh, we can't be too uh, demanding uh, or run the risk of, of either greatly increasing the cost or actually losing the potential to do it at all. I, I think you've stated the, the problem very well. It is a delicate balance. And uh, our report attempted to state the condition as it exists today we attempted to make recommendations to finely tune this uh, organism, but uh, not destroy it. We uh, realized that uh, when we wrote the report that there would be tremendous debate over this very topic. I don't have an easy answer. I think the record will reflect that we have been able to find competent contractors to run the facilities when there have been changes. And uh, I might add that I think that uh, the department uh, in total, uh, not uh, not in particular individuals, but the department has been very um, supportive of this report and, and realizes it's a, a presentation of a condition that exists. Uh, what about the the uh, suggestion that that uh, some of the recommendations that you make for fine tuning would uh, result in uh, vastly increased cost to, in other words, that we'd really find that this program being much more expensive rather than less. Uh. I think that's a, a real concern, and it's a possibility, and um, that's a, a trade-off that has to be weighed very carefully, that we pay now or we pay later. Uh, you did indicate that uh, thus far, at least, uh, your, your report has been constructively received by the department and I think you indicated that they will be responding to some of your recommendations within 60 days, is that? that that's correct. Uh, your report indicates that 29 of the 52 uh, M&O contracts are award fee contracts. Why aren't all of them uh, award fee contracts? If, if that is the, the preferable means of, of uh, handling these things, why shouldn't they all be award fee contracts, even though we recognize there may need to be reforms in terms of the award fee concept? I don't make the decisions on whether or not they're going to, how they're going to, the contract is going to be structured. I can only state that which is. I do know that in some of the instances, especially with the educational or the nonprofit institutions, they are not able, I am told, to accept an award fee. They can't make a profit. Uh, therefore, the management allowances, I believe, uh, have been substituted to cover uh, on defined expenses. So we shouldn't, in your view, then mandate that uh, there be, uh, you know, that these be award fee contracts in every instance, I, I but think should that provide the flexibility to the department to yes, make that I, determination. Um, your report states that every contract should include language that would provide DOE with the capability of removing a contractor employee from DOE work. Uh, do you have any idea why that provision is not uh, presently included in contracts? Uh, and do you think that uh, 
contractors would object to this kind of provision? I don't know why it was uh, omitted. We have tried to, uh, we've talked to the people involved and it appears that that particular clause was left out of the Department of Energy Acquisition Regulations a long time ago. It's not something of recent vintage. It may have been an oversight. As far as um, would the contractors object to it, I can't speak for them. I think it's a reasonable um, control for the Department of Energy to have. Um, I think that uh, if, you, if we're attempting to change the culture and have the contractors maybe be more responsive to the Department of Energy, that's one way to get their attention. Uh, what precipitated your your interest in this area? When, when and how did that uh, come about? I was uh, appointed by the President and confirmed by the Senate to be the Inspector General in 1986, January 1986. Shortly after I became the Inspector General, um, issues about the environment uh, and, the, and the Department of Energy's responsiveness to environmental concerns became uh, one of the pressing issues that my office had to deal with. And I began to look at the history of how the Department of Energy had been operated and, and its relationship with its contractors. And I've worked in other Inspector General's offices in agencies that don't have M&O contractors to the extent that the DOE has. And I was concerned, is, is this in some fashion part of the cause of the problems we face today? And it was with that uh, background that I uh, continually thought about the subject and finally decided that this is a way to look at this issue and uh, coincidentally at about that time Senator Glenn sent me a a, um, a letter asking uh, would I report the results of such an inquiry to him or do such a job and so that's how it came to be. So this was really self-initiated but yes, then sir. with uh, senatorial follow-up or encouragement to proceed with that kind of investigation. Yes, sir. Uh, can, can you equate the, uh, uh, any difference in attitude in terms of the uh, current leadership of the department compared with what you were, uh, what you ha found when you arrived at the department? In terms of, of concern about uh, some of these environmental and safety issues. The, the current administration is concerned about the way the department does business, the, um, the process by which business is done, they're concerned about the nitty-gritty, the details. Um, I work with details. Uh, I find the atmosphere I'm working in to be very conducive to my presenting a report like this and having it dealt with in a positive manner. Uh, I have no complaints. So you don't see your position at this point in, in a sort of an adversarial or confrontational mode? Well, that, inspectors that general weren't created to be loved by anybody in right. particular, and uh, <laughs> I look both ways when I leave anybody's door. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, nice time to also a former member of the Government Operations Committee and also the Congressman of Jurisdiction for uh, Rocky Flats, Colorado, someone who personally uh, walked through the tour with me and has been instrumental in working with this subcommittee uh, uh, in trying to solve the problems not only at Rocky Flats with all nuclear complexes throughout the country, David Skaggs, and after all the subcommittee members have asked questions, we've invited him to join with us. Uh, questions, Mr. Skaggs? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I certainly thank you for your subcommittee's hospitality and letting me join with you this morning. I just want to remind you, you should have never left the committee. <laughs> I'll demur. Uh, Mr. Layton, thank you for your good work on this issue and I appreciate the opportunity to visit with you about um, a couple of the, I hope, big picture issues that have emerged. We've talked a little bit this morning about the trade-off between the award fee system as it presently exists and contractor liability or more precisely immunity from liability. It seems to me that uh, we at least ought to address the question of whether we would be better off in establishing something closer to normal market accounting uh, procedures here with direct contractor liability for mistakes and uh, uh, misdeeds 
recognizing that we're going to have to pay more in the process to get people to accept those risks. And I'd like to ask your views on that question. And in the process, if you would please address the implications that such a rearrangement would have for some of the off-budget costs that we face, uh, or more precisely, costs that haven't been factored in here, uh, the costs that we're now going to have to pick up for cleaning up the problems that have occurred at these facilities that perhaps would have been avoided or at least mitigated had contractors been on the line in a financial sense for their performance. I th if I can remember all of your question, I'll try to answer as much of it as I can. I think that the, the issue of cost and, and when do we pay the cost is an, is an important one. But I'd like to separate that and say that whether, whether or not you have a cost reimbursable contract or a fixed price contract or an indemnified M&O type contract to run these facilities, contract administration, in my opinion, is the key to success. That is, in either situation, and particularly in the cost plus situation, cost reimbursable situation, you have to have government employees, contracting officers, technical representatives, administrative contracting officers, who understand what's happening at a particular facility. They have to know what the government's buying, and they have to know when those goods and services have been received in the fashion that they were supposed to be delivered in. With cost reimbursable contracts, you generally have a much more detailed statement of work, a much more detailed document that lays out the deliverables and the services that are to be performed. That costs money to develop, and it costs money to implement. With a management and operating contract as we have at the DOE facilities, where I might, as a parenthetical phrase, say all, the good, all of the materials are provided by the government, the facility is provided by the government, the assets are provided by the government, and control over expenditures is provided by the government through the budgetary process. In those kinds of facilities, we write a contract that is rather simple. It doesn't have as many people involved in the administration, and therein may lie the rub that we try to administer those contracts or have tried to administer those contracts with fewer people who don't always know what's going on. There aren't enough of them to know what's going on. And that may be the, the problem uh, with, the, with the operation rather than the, the nature of the contract. I don't know that for a fact. You ask my opinion in that uh, that's the way I see it. Would also like your uh, your general observations about whether some of these contractors basically uh, uh, overstay their useful life at facilities. That we have established a pattern in the department uh, of not being tough enough when those five-year renewals come around. And at least it seems to me that a pattern has emerged in which for a first five years with a new contractor, things go pretty well. For the second five years, typically uh, the edge is off a bit, but things are okay. And then it seems not just at Rocky Flats, which I'm familiar with, but perhaps the same theory could be applied elsewhere. We, we see a gradual deterioration of controls and, and uh, appropriate attitude on the part of the contractor, which suggests to me that uh, there's uh, perhaps merit in looking at tougher standards the longer somebody's got control of a particular site. I think that is the essence of contract administration. When somebody arrives and there's a fresh attitude on, on site, everybody is attuned to what they're doing, what they're supposed to, to be doing. As time wears on, that attention to detail probably wanes. But I'm concerned that are there enough people to administer the contracts? Do the people know what's going on? Do we get adequate evaluation of the contractor's performance? That's a, that's a question I don't have an answer to yet.
I'm working on that. If I can ask just one more, Mr. Chairman, I don't want to abuse your kindness in letting me participate. Uh, the GAO report, which I'm sure you've taken a look at, uh, comments in essence, uh, among other things, that the department's own uh, ESH people were either not paid attention to or their evaluations frequently in the form of TSAs and other formal intra-departmental documents were largely ignored by the uh, officials making the award fees to Rockwell at the Rocky Flats plant over the last several cycles. I'm just interested in your own personal experience and your side of the shop in the extent to which you have seen those uh, concerns raised by the environment safety and health people largely discounted or ignored during the award fee process. I can't speak to that. I don't really have an observation of that. I read the GAO report and I'm aware of what you're saying. I think as a writer of reports that are critical, you have to be persistent in, in getting them implemented. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Gaggs. Uh, Mr. Layton, again, thank you. Mr. Brooks, I know you did a lot of the work. We do appreciate uh, your appearance here today and the excellent testimony you provide. As I said, I invite you to stay with us as I think the GAO is going to outline some things that even you may uh, find uh, very interesting. Our next panel is Mr. Keith O. Fultz, the Director of Energy Issues, Resources, and Community and Economic Development Division of the United States General Accounting Office. Today he is accompanied by Mr. William F. Fenzel, Evaluator in Charge, and Ms. Gary L. Jones, uh, Evaluator in Charge. Do any of the three of you have any objection to being sworn in? No, we do not. If not, if you'd raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Welcome again uh, to the subcommittee. And uh, as is the policy, we will uh, admit your whole testimony into the record. And at this time, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman and members, I'll try to keep my comments very brief. We are pleased to provide our views on how DOE rewards its contractors under the awards fee process. We will focus on the awards DOE paid Rockwell at Rocky Flats. As you know, GAO has issued numerous reports and testimonies on serious environmental, safety, and health problems in the nuclear defense complex. Safety problems have actually shut down many key facilities. Significant groundwater and soil contamination exists throughout the complex and environmental laws have been violated. We estimate it could cost over $150 billion to rebuild and clean up the complex. Our recent work has shown that the awards fee program at Rocky Flats has actually downplayed environmental safety and health problems while at the same time emphasizing production. To correct past mistakes, DOE must manage its facilities and contractors with a much higher degree of emphasis on and commitment to environmental safety and health matters. Before discussing the awards process, I would like to provide some perspective on the problems at Rocky Flats. Reviews by GAO and others have identified persistent safety and health deficiencies. Rocky Flats has had serious problems in the environmental area, particularly groundwater contamination, improper storage and handling of hazardous waste, and numerous inactive waste sites. A particular concern in the safety area were problems in the plant's radiological programs and a lack of commitment by the plant's management to improve overall safety and health conditions. Because of these concerns, in February 1988, DOE instituted measures to improve conditions at the plant, including setting up a 24-hour surveillance by DOE staff. However, safety problems persisted. In September 1988, a contamination incident in a key processing building led to a DOE, DOE review which found inadequate radiological safety margins. As a result of this review, this facility was temporarily shut down on October the 7th, 1988. I will now discuss the award fees provided Rockwell over the past three years. 
Although significant environmental safety and health problems have persisted at the plant, Rockwell received about $27 million in award fees since 1986. Part of these awards is attributable to Rockwell being rated from, and I'm quoting here from the DOE documents, moderately good, end quote, to, quote, excellent, end quote, in their performance of environmental safety and health matters. Some portion is also attributable to Rockwell accomplishing specific objectives for increased production or efficiency at the plant. Now, in looking at the awards fee process, we found a number of problems in how DOE administered the program. First, environmental and safety problems were downplayed. In this regard, we question actually whether DOE considered the significance of the environmental and safety deficiencies when they rated Rockwell. We also noted that some deficiencies were not mentioned at all in the evaluation process. That is, many reports critical of safety or environmental man matters were never mentioned as deficiencies in some of the evaluations. In other instances, when deficiencies were mentioned, the rating plan was not followed. Thus, the ratings and resultant awards were higher than they should have been using the DOE criteria. Overall, GAO believes that the seriousness of the safety and health problems were never adequately conveyed in the evaluations conducted at Rocky Flats. Now, we are particularly concerned that production has been emphasized over safety matters in the awards process. During fiscal years 1986, 1987, and 1988, the weight given to environmental safety and health matters in four of the six evaluation periods was less than the weight given to production activities. During fiscal year 1986, for example, safety and health was not even considered as a distinct functional area. In addition, all specific of achievement objectives emphasized production. Sometimes that even conflicted with safety concerns. For example, Mr. Chairman, about two months before the shutdown of one building for safety problems, DOE awarded Rockwell $310,000 for increased production of plutonium from the operations conducted in that building. And finally, DOE's contract with Rockwell did not require that the final determinations be approved or even reviewed by DOE headquarters. We believe all awards should be reviewed so they reflect more than just the reviews or opinions of an operations office. In summary, DOE's award process can be an important management tool to encourage the performance of its contractors. DOE needs to implement the process in a manner that ensures that adequate attention is given to environmental safety and health matters. Frankly, DOE has not done a good job administering its Rocky Flats awards contract. It is now making changes to improve the process and these changes are good. But given the significance of the problem throughout the entire nuclear defense complex, DOE needs to ensure that the awards process promotes excellence and that poor performance will not be rewarded. Our report does contain a number of recommendations which hopefully will, will help solve some of the problems. Now that concludes my summary. We'd be pleased to respond to any questions that you or members may have. Well, first of all, thank you very much for that very helpful testimony. Let me take the prerogative of the chairman to commend you and also the staff uh, for the excellent job you've all done to prepare for today's hearing. As many people are aware, we're releasing three GAO reports that we're discussing today, and I know a lot of hours have been put into this, and I really want to thank all of the people at GAO. I want to congratulate you on your promotion. We're glad to see that uh, you're being rewarded for the excellent work you've done. I only hope all those others who've worked in this behalf are going to be recognized uh, also, because I know they've worked very hard, Many too. Many have been, sir, and thank you for your kind remarks. Let me uh, start off, if I could. Why don't you explain for the, the committee and the subcommittee here today how the award fee process works, Mr. Fultz? Okay. In essence, the awards program is set up to enhance contractor performance. Uh, it gives the contractor an opportunity to make more money than what it could have under a fixed fee contract uh, by providing award fees uh, based on actual performance in, in carrying out the, uh, the procedures and in and, and completing the operations within the complex. At Rocky Flats, uh, the awards fee process actually has two components. 
One were uh, semi-annual evaluations and the other was goal achievement objectives. Now under the semi-annual evaluations, DOE conducts uh, reviews of various performance areas such as production, general plant maintenance, environmental health and safety, and rates and scores each of these areas. It then comes up with an overall or total score which is applied to a sliding scale and which is already predetermined. Let me give an example. If, if the contractor uh, receives a score of 88, then the contractor would get a certain percentage of the award fee pool, something like in the order of uh, 80, 84 percent. Once that score is given, the, the uh, scale is applied and then the Albuquerque office makes the final award determination. As I said in my, in my summary, that heretofore was not reviewed by anybody in headquarters. It was solely the decision of the Albuquerque office. In addition to the semi-annual evaluations um, at Rocky, there are also special objectives that have been established which the contractor is charged with trying to meet. If they meet those objectives, then they're also given uh, additional funds. All right. How much money uh, has Rockwell received over the last couple of years in award fees? Under the semi-annual evaluations for 86, 87, and 88, Rockwell received uh, about $25 million. And then using the special goal achievement objectives uh, which they performed, they were also given slightly over $2 million for the total of around $27 million for those three years. Now, is this process or concept the same throughout the Department of Energy? The basic concept is the same throughout uh, the department. But in practice, the various operations office uh, might have a different slant as to how they implement it. Some have three uh, uh, evaluations each year, for example, rather than the two at Rocky. And um, some use different scales, different grading, and they also use different functional areas. But as far as, as I understand, Rocky is the only facility that has the uh, goal achievement objectives as part of its awards fee program. I'm not aware of any others that have that. All right. Throughout your report, Mr. Fultz, you point to environmental safety and health problems that have been downplayed. Can you give the subcommittee some examples of that? Yes, I can. Um, for the evaluation period between uh, October 87 and March of 88, which is a six-month period, DOE gave Rockwell a rating of, and I'm quoting here, moderately good, that's on the scale, in safety and health. But yet in, in analyzing that, that evaluation and reviewing what was going on at that period of time, we found a, a, what we can consider a number of problems that were uh, present at that time of that evaluation. For example, a technical safety analysis was issued which was very critical of the plant safety performance at this time. We also understand that there was actually discussions of shutting down the operations at Rocky Flats due to safety concerns around that time. And it was also during this period that because of their concerns about safety matters that the department uh, created a special 24-hour surveillance team by DOE staff that went out to the uh, facility and, and maintained basically a watch for around the clock. Now, this occurred from February through uh, May. Um, there was another safety evaluation or an evaluation report in the March to uh, September time frame in 88. Um, in this particular evaluation, DOE rated Rockwell good. And that's, a, again, a quote from the rating scale in uh, environmental safety and health matters. But again, in analyzing what was occurring at this time, we found numerous problems in the environmental health and safety area. One concerned the problem that, that developed with concrete, which is a mixture of cement and waste that is, is conducted at the uh, facility, which uh, the waste is, is supposed to be mixed with cement, stored away, and then shipped off-site to another storage facility. Uh, during this period, they found that because of a, an inadequate mixture of cement and waste, uh, 2,000 of 17,000 boxes of this waste actually were not formed properly and were causing problems. Um, this occurred during this rating period when, when the contractor was rated good. But we understand, uh, and we don't have precise figures on this, but we understand that this mistake, if you will, 
could cost uh, in the area of six hundred to six hundred and fifty thousand dollars to correct. It was also during this period that there were many safety problems that were continually surfacing uh, through various and sundry other reviews at the plant. And it was also during this period that the contamination incident occurred in building 771 which eventually resulted in that facility being shut down temporarily for a number of months. But I, I think there's one recurring theme or lack of a theme I'll say that we saw in looking at the evaluations. They did not capture other reports and analyses that were reported during the period or that were done by other groups including GAO. Um, a key document which occurs at nuclear facilities is called a safety analysis review which in essence is a document, it's an analysis, a review that demonstrates that a nuclear facility can be operated safely. We found in 1982 that certain safety analysis reviews were not conducted at uh, the Rocky Flats uh, certain facilities. We again reported in 1986 that the safety analysis reviews had not yet been completed. So we had a period of time where important reviews were not being reported. But when Rockwell finally completed these reviews, it was mentioned in the DOE evaluation report as an especially noteworthy achievement. In other words, they were given credit for doing something that was late. Are you telling me that they were given credit and it was identified as especially noteworthy achievement for accomplishing something six to seven years late? That is correct. Now, did DOE accurately reflect the environmental safety and health problems in the award process? Based on our review, I would have to say no, that they did not. Um, and, and in our opinion, in looking at the, the awards fee process at Rocky, uh, the process was, was not carried out in the interest, uh, the best interest of the government. Well, does that, does that show a particular attitude on the part of DOE in your estimation? Yes, I, I've been reviewing issues in the, in the Department of Energy complex now for about five years, and the staff sitting beside me have been in there much longer than I have. I think that there has been a reluctance or a desire on DOE's part not to admit the extent of the problems to the degree to which they are existing. Uh, well, they just don't want to admit, didn't want to admit that the problems were as severe as they, as they really are. Well, tell me about your trip to Rocky Flats. When did you go and with whom did you go? In September, Mr. Bowser, the Comptroller General, uh, Mr. Peach, who is the director of my division, myself, and Mr. Bannerman, who you know has done substantial work in the environmental health and safety area, visited Rocky Flats to indoctrinate Mr. Bowser uh, in, into the process and also take a tour of Rocky Flats. What and was the attitude of the Rockwell staff when you were out there, Mr. Fultz? Regretfully, I'd, I'd have to say that, that they still, at that time, this was September just last month, were of the opinion um, that the problems really weren't as, as great as what was being reported in the press or perhaps what um, um, politicians in, in their words were saying that the problems were. I, I, we just got a sense that they did not have a full appreciation for the degree or severity of the problems. Didn't they tell you that politicians were just trying to chase headlines? I believe that comment was made uh, during the tour, yes. So you're saying that there's an attitude problem out there and similar to what uh, Secretary of Energy uh, Watkins has been saying all along, isn't it? Yes, uh, we, we certainly want to give the Secretary credit for recognizing that and I think he really is sincere in trying to turn that attitudinal uh, uh, position around. Given the recent trip, other indications that we have, I think it's going to take a very, very long time before we see a dramatic change in, the, in, in this attitude. And again, the uh, awards fee process, the indemnification process that, that Mr. Layton testified to earlier are ways that you can begin to address that. Did you all get to tour Building 771? No, as a matter of fact, we did not. It was um, on the uh, scheduled tour that we had set up with the Rockwell people but uh, 
we, I, we got there, I believe it was on a Thursday, and we were told that they had had a rainstorm uh, Monday or Tuesday of that week, and that the roof had leaked, and that the building was, uh, as described to us, pretty much in disrepair, so they asked us if we would mind uh, not touring uh, Building 771. They thought, said it was probably uh, very wet and, and probably not in the best of condition. That kind of concerns you when a rainstorm can cause that kind of problem, don't you think? Well, uh, we were told by uh, our Denver staff that it wasn't really that bad a rainstorm. All right. Now, you also said that your award fee structure, that the award fee structure at Rocky Flats emphasized production over environment and safety. Is that correct? Yes, it, it did. Um, the, as I mentioned, the semi-annual evaluations uh, generally put more weight on production. And in analyzing the evaluations, the six over that three-year period, uh, I saw a trend that quite frankly surprised me. The last evaluation period that we examined was sometime in, in late 88. Production, the weight given production actually increased from 30 to 40 percent during that time period, whereas the environmental health and safety actually went down from 30 percent to 20 percent. And that surprised me, given all the revelations and concern about uh, the problems in the complex. And that was the most recent evaluation that we saw. And you mentioned also that they got the 310,000 increase for production about two months before they shut down, correct? That is correct. Is it fair to say that the goal achievement objectives is a second bite of that award fee apple, Mr. Fultz? I think it's fair to say that the money's paid and money's not paid under the awards fee process can be earned under a goal achievement program, if I could restate your question somewhat. All right. Will DOE's initiatives correct the problems, Mr. Fultz? We believe that the DOE initiatives will go a long way in correcting the, the problems. However, as with any substantive change like you're seeing, it's going to take a long time for that to occur. So I would say that the jury is still out as to how effective they will be eventually. Um, we think some of the changes are very good. We were very pleased to see the headquarters review aspect added. We think that's very necessary. Uh, however, we are concerned that there, there still is uh, too much judgment or discretion allowed the evaluators. Well, what do you think needs to be done? Very simply, I, I think more criteria is going to be needed um, so that the uh, DOE can spell out for the contractor how various types of deficiencies will be treated and to give the evaluators some type of criteria to use to make the judgments from